Welcome to the September 2018 session of the SCR Connections webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, Susanna Privet. Susanna is with the Data Dissemination Program for the U.S. Census Bureau. As the Data Dissemination Specialist for Texas and Oklahoma, Susanna gives presentations and conducts workshops about Census Bureau data, various surveys, and internet sites. She works closely with organizations, local governments, businesses, federal and state agencies, and many more to provide a clear understanding of the Census Bureau and the data they collect. That's exactly what she'll be doing for us today. Susanna has held a variety of positions over the years with the Bureau of the Census. Uh, she started with the Dallas region during the 2000 census as an office clerk and later as a regional tech for the Houston area. After the dis this centennial census, she moved to the Dallas Regional Office as an office clerk and soon transferred to the American Community Survey and the National Crime Victimization Survey as a lead clerk. Eventually, she accepted the position of Information Services Specialist Assistant with Partnership and Data Services for the Dallas Region, a position in which she served for five years. In 2012, Susanna decided to work with the Denver Region in her current position as Data Dissemination Specialist, and it allowed her to remain in Texas. Uh, we're very excited to have her with us in today's session. I'll go ahead and pass the ball over to her so she can get started live sharing some of the wonderful information we have on the Census Bureau website. Good morning, Susanna. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great, great. Well, I'm really happy to have this opportunity today to speak to everyone about our data. And it's actually not just my data, it's all of our data. All the data that we collect belongs to all of us. There's no copyright, so the data can be used in any way that you choose, although we do ask that you give us credit for collecting the data. But the data does belong to all of us. So um, I thank Ms. Miles for this opportunity, and I have a picture of myself up on the screen. It's in my car. I spend a lot of time in my car, as she mentioned, driving the roads of Texas and Oklahoma. And that has actually turned out to be a great experience because it gives me an opportunity to see what areas look like so that when data call, uh, users call, I kind of understand where they are and what that looks like. Please don't hesitate to give me a call, send me an email. Um, I'm very customer service oriented, um, so please don't hesitate to contact me at any time, even if you're not sure it's about data that belongs uh, to the Census Bureau. I might know the source and can give that to you. So let me, uh, talking about jobs, um, working for the, the Census Bureau, I want to first go to our page that was just released for uh, 2020 census jobs. For us, 2020 is right around the corner. Um, we have offices that are opening in every state and then sub offices in different locations within those states. And obviously we need a lot of people to do the work that we need to do in a short amount of time. So if you can see the um, URL, it's 2020census.gov, G-O-V, slash jobs, and that will take you to this page. So you may not be looking for a job, but someone else might. Um, it's a great job for students, uh, people that retired, really anyone uh, that wants to do a job for a short term. These are term jobs. You are hired from one period to another, and this is how I was hired. And um, but you were offered other positions as you go along. So this is a great opportunity for anyone who's wanting to maybe get into federal government work. Um, now I'm going to move over to our census.gov page. And if any of you have been on our page, you've seen that we have gone through some changes in the last few years. And that is because we have a new communications director, and he is dragging us into the new world, uh, which is a great thing. Um, but I say that 
tongue in cheek because uh, we have really focused on collecting the data and not necessarily how we're presenting it to our data users. So I am sure some of you have felt the frustration of going on our website and trying to find data for whatever reason and being frustrated because it might not have been as easy as it should have been. So we are working very, very hard to make changes, um, adding more graphics, um, adding, as you can see here on the front page, access to some of our data tools, quick facts, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, a great place to, to go in, get a number, and get out if that's all you're needing. Um, we're trying to give news uh, about the data, releases, uh, stories. Uh, there may be uh, some ways you're not even aware of that people are using our data and what's available. We're also trying to give you a heads up. We're doing a lot more webinars, and obviously we're always out in the community doing presentations and workshops, so we've added a calendar to the main page so that that will help you to see where we are if you want to go and attend uh, one of our events in person. So speaking of the changes that we're making, um, we have started um, creating more infographs which I have really been excited about. And to access these infographs, when you're on our census.gov page, you can go over to the Library tab, click on that, and you'll see Infographics. And click on that, and you'll get a whole list. This is a one that was just released recently, September the 13th. What can you learn? from the American Community Survey. Very easy to use. Uh, you select your geography, state, congressional district, or metropolitan statistical area. And then uh, over on the left, I have selected poverty. But if you're wanting to select um, education, then the map will change. And these are metropolitan statistical areas because that's what I've uh, indicated. And you can look at these different topics and get a visual across the nation of uh, what the data is for these areas. And as you noticed, if I just put my cursor, um, very interactive. It gives you the area and the information about the area. So I'm really excited about this because this is actually probably what I get asked the most. Uh, everyone wants our maps to be interactive, and we're getting there slowly but surely, where you'll be able to click on a map and get data for the area that you're selecting. Now, um, there's another info uh, graphic. Let me click on this. Um, that has just been released also recently. I know when I go to uh, meetings or conferences or do exhibits, I actually carry the paper version of this data wheel. Um, and so you can actually turn the wheel to whatever state, and it will give you these selected topics, the data for those selected topics. So I selected Arkansas, but if I were to select um, New Mexico, ah, well, I got an error. Let's try this again. Uh, you can select different states or congressional districts or, well, it's not going to work for me. Too many of us are trying to access it, evidently. You can select states congressional districts or metropolitan statistical areas, and it will give you the information for these selected topics. So I thought that was a, a great new infographic that you can use if you're looking for these particular statistics. Now, I'm going back to census.gov, 
I don't know if any of you were following along with me. Um, if you are, please uh, let Sarah know that I'm going too fast for you. I'm going to uh, basically talk today about geography, um, about some of our topics, and then I'm going to give you some tables that I feel that if you're wanting to assess an area, whether it's for a uh, grant, uh, a project that you're on, uh, or you have a new area that you're covering that you want to know more about, these tables will give you a great statistical picture of those areas or communities. So the first thing I need to talk about is our data sources. Probably the, the data sources that you would be using would either be from our census data, we count the nation every 10 years, every year that ends with a zero. So the latest data we have from that is 2010, or you would be using data from the American Community Survey, which we do every month in every county in the nation. That, however, is a sample survey. So, for example, you might get the survey, but no one else in your neighborhood would. So your answers would be extremely important because you're answering for a whole area uh, that you live in. So if you're looking at the American Community Survey, we collect a lot of data, and this is the data that most of you would use, uh, again, to assess a community or to do a grant, uh, because this data is available down to the tract level. And I'll talk about uh, what a tract looks like here in just a moment. Um, the decennial or 2010 data is available down to a block level. A block is the smallest uh, geography that we disseminate data. So the 2010 is down to the block level, and the ACS, or American Community Survey data, is available down to the tract or a community size level. So if you have questions about the American Community Survey, I have here in front of us, the American Community Survey page. And it tells you everything and more that you ever wanted to know about the survey, whether you got the survey or someone is asking about the survey, or you're wondering what questions did we ask to get the data that we've collected. And there's an area here, why do you ask each question? And that's a great place to go to get those answers on why we ask the questions that we ask. Um, a lot of people uh, believe that the Census Bureau makes up these questions and that we're asking these questions because we want to know when actually different agencies and organizations go to Congress and ask them if these questions can be asked, and then Congress has to give permission in order for us to ask the questions that are on the American Community Survey, as well as the questions, for example, that will be coming up on the 2020 Census. We've been sending our questions over to Congress for them to approve so that we can ask questions of the nation. So these questions really are coming from other places, um, and we are just the collectors of the data. So as you can see, there are a lot of different types of questions on the American Community Survey, which makes it perfect for anyone assessing a community. It gives you a lot of information. Now, um, each one of these sections that we're looking at, you can click on and it will give you the questions um, as they appear on the form. And I'm going to get to one here in just a second. Let's see. Just one moment here. 
uh, commuting uh, or your journey to work is a question that we get asked a lot as to why we're asking that question. Um, people say, well, I don't want you to know what time I leave to go to work or what time I come home. But obviously these questions are asked because of local, state, and federal agencies wanting to know when are roads most busy, uh, when is there congestion, uh, in order to plan for uh, road maintenance and possibly new roads. So these questions are coming from different agencies that are wanting to know for those reasons. Um, so that's just an example of what you would see with any of the questions on the American Community Survey on this page. So I'm going to shift gears and go to geography and this is a PDF of the different levels of geography that we have. Um, at the top you see nation, regions, divisions, uh, then states, counties, going down the center, census tracts, block groups, census blocks, and then you'll see over to the sides, congressional districts, uh, zip code tabulation areas. So even though we have all these different levels of geography, we do not have all data available at all levels of geography. And it's really important that you remember that, that uh, some data that's available at a track level may not be available at a zip code level or at a block level may not be available at a state level. So probably the way to explain this best is there's two types of geography that we are talking about. One would be considered legal, the other statistical. Legal meaning that there was some type of legal action that happened to create the boundaries. So that would be a nation, um, a state, counties, and we call cities, towns, um, villages, we call those places. So some legal action happened in order to establish those boundaries. Now statistical would be census tracts, block groups, census blocks, and also zip code tabulation areas. Now we have zip code data. Zip codes belong to the post office. And so they are responsible for those boundaries of zip codes. So they can change the boundaries as needed. Um, so we change our information about zip code boundaries based on the post office. And there will be times when possibly we don't have the new information or there's some other reason um, as to why we don't have everything we need to have the same boundaries, we will create bound, zip code boundaries that are as close to the boundaries that the post office has for zip codes, and that's what we call a zip code tabulation area. So sometimes if you're looking at data by a zip code, you'll see a zip code, and then you'll see ZCTA, zip code tabulation areas, or sometimes you'll see one or the other depending on what's available for that particular zip code number. So those are the differences in the zip code. Um, with census tracts, this is what I was referring to earlier, this is a statistical geography. This is something that the Census Bureau came up with in order to disseminate data at a lower level than county, city, state, nation. So census tracts range from about 
1,200 to 8,000 in population. That's a range that we try to keep all census tract populations within. And we do that for comparison purposes. So you could compare tracts in New Mexico with tracts in Arkansas or tracts in uh, Massachusetts. Um, so we're trying to keep all census tracts within that population range. Tracts are not based on the size or the area. They're based, the size of a tract is based on the population within that track and within that range. Block groups uh, are another division within a census track. And then census blocks is the lowest geography or division of area. So the way this works, it's sort of like the Russian dolls, with the census blocks being the smallest doll that fits inside block groups that fits inside census tracts, that fits inside counties, states, and the nation. So uh, at a census block, the lowest level, that would be typically in an urban area the size of the block that you live in, whether you live in an apartment or a house. In an urban area, that's about the size of a census block. So. We also, um, we have blocks fitting within a tract. So the block boundaries only go to the track boundaries. They never cross the track boundaries that they are within. And the track boundaries never cross county boundaries. So each county has their own set of tracks. And each track has their own set of blocks within those tracks. So you will come across numbering for these blocks and tracks that will start over within each county, depending on what area you're looking at. So I hope I haven't confused you. If I have, please remind me to explain this again at the end when we have questions. So. I just wanted to explain that to you. Um, and again, I hope I haven't confused anyone. Now, going back to census.gov, I did mention a moment ago about um, QuickFacts. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever used QuickFacts, but this is a great place to go if you've got um, a number that you're trying to get and you're wanting to um, get that number and don't want to have to pull up a table, QuickFacts is actually a collection of our most requested statistics, whether people are calling us or they're going on our website looking for this information. So if you're needing a population number or an ethnicity or race, um, a lot of this will be in quick facts. I selected the state of Louisiana, so we're looking at the statistics for that state. Um, it includes housing, education, um, poverty, uh, veteran status. Uh, there is a lot of information that you can get from Quick Facts without having to go in and pull a table of data to find a number. So this might be a place to go if you're working on a report, a PowerPoint, and you just need that one number for an area. Also, uh, on Quick Facts, you can use it as a tool to compare um, because you can select more than one geography. So I could select up to five counties or five states um, if that's what I need to look at. So you can just continue to add the state, city, county, or even zip code here at the top, and it will continue to add columns up to five. Um, and then if you want to just 
quickly get to one of the statistics, you can select that from the top here. So this is a great place to go to get a number if that's all you're needing and don't need to go to a, a whole table to pull the data. There's always the very latest statistics on Quick Facts. Whatever our latest information is, it's what's presented here. So you always know that this is the newest information. And you can always go to this I information button on the left side if you're wanting to be able to cite where you got your information, it gives you the source of where that particular statistic uh, came from, um, some definitions, or maybe you've decided that you need more data. So there's a link at the bottom here, in this case, veterans data, that you can click on to start looking at other information, uh, other data about veterans. So it's sort of a gateway to more data if that's what you're needing. So again, uh, quick facts. This is from the main page of census.gov. So you can quickly go to a number if that's what you're needing. Now I'm going to move on to some of the data tables that I was referring to before. Um, this, uh, I am in American Fact Finder, and for those of you that are familiar with that, that is the, and those that aren't, that is the place on our website where you can actually pull up the tables of data. There are five tables that I feel are most helpful uh, to get a good picture of an area. They are data profile tables, or um, DP is the beginning of the table number for data profile. There, there's DP05, DP04, 03, 02, and then DP1 without the zero. So I'm sort of starting backwards with these. Um, DP5 is a great table, and I just selected New Orleans um, because I was just there, had a great time, of course. I don't think I've ever had a bad time in New Orleans. So this uh, is data for New Orleans. This is the DP5, and I like to call this the basically the, the race and ethnicity table. Although when you look at the name of the table, ACS Demographic and Housing Estimates, that really doesn't tell you exactly what's in the table. Um, but the DP5 basically, as you can see, has to do with gender, age, race and ethnicity. That's basically what's covered in this table. So if that's the type of information you're needing, DP05 would be the table to pull up. So it gives you the total population, uh, and in this case, this table gives you an estimate and a percent. There are tables that give you one or the other. Um, I also want to mention margin of error. Um, that is something that you need to keep an eye on because with the American Community Survey, um, there are a lot of areas that you're able to pull up data and because it's a smaller area in some cases, um, and also because it's a sample survey, the margin of error is high. And so that is a decision that you as a data user has to make on using that particular estimate or percent. So I'm just asking that you be aware of the margin of errors for the data, depending on the areas that you're looking at. So going down on this uh, DP5, you come into race. We ask, uh, there are five that we ask that you identify with one of them. Uh, and they are white, 
black or African American, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander. Those are the five that we ask on our surveys and census that you identify with one of those. However, um, people sometimes choose to identify with two or more races, um, or sometimes because uh, race and ethnicity is confusing, uh, they will give us ancestry, for example, Italian and German or Swedish, something like that. So you will see that we have in some of our race and ethnicity tables, uh, there will be a uh, line for other races, um, and a lot of times that is where that is coming from because they've given us an answer other than the five uh, that I just mentioned that we are asking about. Um, the, the thing to pay attention on this particular table is that this is race, so those are the five races. However, if you're wanting to take a look at an area and count everyone, I suggest that you look at the section that is Hispanic or Latino and race because being Hispanic or Latino, you can be either white, black, any of the races. So the way we ask the question is, are you Hispanic or Latino, and it's yes or no. So if you answered yes, here would be that answer. If you answered no, here would be this answer. So it's sort of the indentions are important. That's showing you sort of the breakdown of the answers of the questions. And then below each one, if they were Hispanic or Latino and they indicated one of these, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or other, and if they were not Hispanic or Latino and they indicated the race or some other race or two or more races, that's indicated here. This is including everyone. This gives you the breakdown for everyone in an area. Whereas up above in the race section, that is only counting the people that selected uh, white, black, uh, and so forth. So it would not include the people that indicated Hispanic or Latino. So that's important to, to pay attention to. I'm going to move on to the next data profile table. I'm going to go back to advanced search. Show me all. And I am just typing here because I know the table number and hitting go. Then I'm going to select a geography. And because our geography uh, database is in alphabetical order, It will try to help you populate, if you're typing it in, um, which geography you're actually looking for. I'm going to close this window. So now in my selections box, I have my geography and I have my table. And that's simply because I already know the table number. I'm hoping that we'll do another webinar when I can show you more step-by-step -step on selecting tables. So this is the DP04 table. This table has to do with housing. You can actually tell what's in this table by the name. Anything related to housing. And so I selected Dallas as my geography. I have estimates and percent. So as you can see here, um, occupancy, the number of units in the structure, 
when the structure was built, the number of rooms, and a lot of what we collect is uh, due to HUD because we do collect a lot of housing data for HUD. So that is why we have this broken down uh, this way, the number of bedrooms, tenure, whether it's uh, a mortgage or renting, um, the number of vehicles available, the heating fuel, um, and even the facilities, plumbing and kitchen, um, and telephone service. I see this going away fairly soon since pretty much everyone has a cell phone. Uh, occupants per room, again, that is something that HUD would be looking for. Um, then value for the housing units, uh, mortgage status, with or without a mortgage, uh, owner costs, and I uh, lease a home, and so I have looked at uh, what the costs are uh, for rent in different areas when I have moved, and I have used census data for that. Um, so the rent, um, now this is for Dallas City as a whole, but we could look at this down to a track level or a neighborhood level. So you can see there's a lot of information on this particular table having to do with housing. The next table that I want to show you is the DP03. And even though it's trying to help me, if you're putting in a table or topic name here, uh, I suggest unless you're really familiar with the table that you don't select one of these. That way it'll give you more to choose from. And I am just selecting the first one, which is the latest that we have, the one-year estimates. The five-year estimates will be released December the 6th of this year. But we just released the one-year estimates for ACS data. Now, this table is selected economic characteristics. So basically anything that has to do with money or earnings is what you're going to find on this particular table. Again, I have Dallas as my geography. I didn't change that. This table gives you information on employment status, commuting to work, a question that we looked at earlier, occupation, industry, class of worker, income, and then that's household income um, or family income and per capita. Now, if you're ever working on a grant, it's really important to make sure you know what the funder is asking. Are they asking for income from households? or from families. Household income, anyone that is of working age working um, that has an income is included in total household income. Family, it's more the traditional, the mom, the dad, the, the parents, um, the adults uh, of the household are the ones that are included here for family income. So there is a difference uh, that you need to pay attention to uh, when looking at some of this data. This table also has information on health insurance coverage. We didn't always have that question on ACS, but we do now. And then poverty. Um, in poverty level, that is really established by the Office of Management and Budget. So if you're wanting to know more about that, I can, I can show you where to find that information. Uh, mentioning uh, the terms, for example, of uh, household and family income, we do have a glossary. I highly, highly recommend that you take a look at what some of the terms mean 
you may think that a term means something, but to know the actual definition of terms that we use would be important, uh, especially when you're doing a lot of the, the grant uh, data research. Now we're going to look at uh, DP02, now this particular table is sort of like DP05, you can't really tell by the name of it what's included in that table. So this is a collection of a lot of different data, there's some um, household data, the households by type, uh, for example, female householder with no husband present, and then number of children under 18. Non-family is um, anyone, uh, to be a family household, at least two people must be related. So brother and sister, parent and child, husband and wife, they must be related. Um, Non-family would be everything else. So those are two different types of households to uh, pay attention to. Relationship, this is usually the relationship to the householder or in a lot of cases the person that was responsible for filling out the census or the survey. Marital status, and it's broken down by gender. Fertility. Um, that is from the CDC uh, that we asked that question. Uh, grandparents, another question we weren't asking, but because of the phenomenon of uh, grandparents raising their children now, um, we started asking questions about that, school enrollment, uh, educational attainment, veteran status, um, disability status, and obviously for each one of these, we have many, many, many more tables and some tables with much more detail uh, than these. Uh, residence a year ago, place of birth, and we also um, have citizenship status. We never ask whether someone is legal or illegal, but we do ask their citizenship status. Year of entry, world region, language spoken at home, and ancestry. And then at the very bottom, they kind of slipped in computers and internet use, which is a question we only recently started asking. So you can see there's a variety of topics on this particular um, table. Um, so I can't tell you just it's one specific thing, uh, unfortunately, and let's see, I'm getting close to my time, so let me go to the last table that I want to show you, and that's going to be DP1 without the zero, and that's going to be the 2010. 100% data, and they say 100% data because we uh, are counting everyone in the nation as opposed to the American Community Survey, which is a sample, um, and so not everyone gets that um, survey. So from this DP1, the data shown on this table, and it's still Dallas, I've not changed the geography, um, is all the data that we collected from those 10 questions that we asked in 2010. So it's uh, gender, age, and these are age ranges. If you're ever looking for a table that has each individual uh, age, um, you know, how many are five years old, how many are 15 years old, uh, I believe that table number is PT12, I might be off a number, but I believe it's PT12 um, that you would use to find the ages broken down individually. But most of the age tables will have a range. Uh, median, um, 
then the breakdown by gender with the age ranges. This particular table also has race and um, Hispanic or Latino, and then Hispanic or Latino and race. Uh, but again, this is from the 2010 census. We saw some of this on the American Community Survey. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is if you're needing official population numbers, maybe you're filling out a government form, or maybe on the grant uh, that you're doing or some other project, you need official numbers. If you're needing uh, official population numbers, those are the, the numbers that would be on the DP1 table for whatever area you select. Or if you're needing population numbers for within, for example, uh, 2010 and 2020, the years in between those, you would go to our population estimates tables, and those would be considered official population numbers for the areas that you're selecting. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, this table also includes relationship. And this table also, I want to point out, uh, includes group quarters. That would be hospitals, prisons, uh, dormitories, places like that. Uh, we call those group quarters, and then households by type, um, housing occupancy, tenure. Those are all the topics that come from the data we collected from the 2010 census. So I have given you a lot of information in a short amount of time, so please don't hesitate on letting me know if uh, you're needing to uh, have more specific uh, instruction, or hopefully we will have a webinar when I can give you some more details on pulling up tables that you're, you're needing. And let me stop sharing so that if anyone has questions, Great, thank you so much, Susanna. We will go ahead and open it up for questions now. You all can feel free to enter your questions into the chat box. Um, we do already have one question for you, Susanna. Um, is, are there any specific tables that focus on health-related issues? And if so, do you have those table numbers you could share with us? What we have a lot of the, uh, we do some health surveys. A lot of what we collect you will be able to find on the CDC website. Uh, that is one of the major uh, uh, agencies that asks us to collect health-related data. So we really don't, other than having uh, information on disabilities and maybe the breakdown of different types of disabilities, but if you're looking for things more specific, you would have to go to the CDC website for that, unfortunately. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. How do you find out data on diseases uh, on the county level? Is that something else you would find at the CDC, Susanna? Yes, that would be the CDC, yes. Okay. Um, here's another question. Can you show us uh, ready-to-use TIGER? Is that something you can demonstrate, Susanna? That is not something I can demonstrate, but I can connect you with someone that can. We do have geographers, and if you will let me know, I will put you in contact with one of our geographers, and they can walk you through that. Uh, that is what they do, they help our data users with anything with TIGER, GIS, so I'd be happy to connect you with them. Great, and I will have uh, Debbie find Susanna's email, she'll go ahead and share it again in the chat box, so if you have any questions, you can go ahead and reach out to her. I know we had someone earlier, Susanna, who's wanting more information on trainers, and I said you'd be happy to help them out, so I shared your email with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. 
Um, I did notice there was also a question about the recording. Yes, this session is currently being recorded and we will have the link to our YouTube channel ready by the end of this week. I shared the link there in the chat box. We can find that link posted. Uh, we'll also try to send it out with the announcement of our next session. Uh, it looks like someone has shared a little bit more information for health statistics. There's a morbidity and mortality weekly report from the CDC. Thank you so much for sharing that, Corinne. Uh, we have another question for you, Susanna. Is there a list of table numbers and what each table contains anywhere? Um, not, not how you would want it to be, unfortunately. However, for these tables that I talked about, I created my own handout that um, I sort of did a spreadsheet that tells you each topic and where it's located in each table. And if you will email me, I will be happy to share that with you. That's the least I could do. I That was one of the first things when I started. I kept thinking, don't they have like an easier way to find this? So I ended up creating my own for these DP tables. So um, I'll be happy to share that with you and then maybe show you some areas that um, it's not going to be in the format that would be easiest to use, I guess, and that's a little disappointing for me. So, um, but I'll be happy to share what I have with you. Thank you so much, Susanna. I have put Susanna's email in the chat. Again, it is her name, susanna.privet at census.gov. So please feel free to reach out to her for some of these questions. Does anyone else have any questions right now for Susanna? We have a few more minutes. If you could enter your questions into the chat box. I'll give everyone about a minute or so to see if we do have any further questions for today. I know Susanna mentioned the possibility of doing another webinar session for us. We will be talking with her about the possibility of a future session, um, perhaps going a little bit more in depth with using some of the data that is available on their website. So um, Susanna and I will talk about that and everyone else can be on the lookout, hopefully for information about that future webinar. Yes, I'd, I'd love to do that, absolutely. Great, thank you so much, Susanna. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions at the moment. Uh, hopefully everyone will okay. go ahead and reach out to Susanna. We will also have our SCR email address available in just a moment, so you can reach out to us as well if you have any questions about today's session. Um, so I'll go ahead and wrap it up and give a big thank you, Susanna, for a wonderful session today. Um, thank you so much for presenting uh, this wonderful content for us. No problem, and just uh, reach out to me and I will walk you through anything I've gone through or anything else that you're looking for. That is my job and I'm happy to do it. So thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks, Susanna. I will ask if everyone would stick around just a couple more seconds. We do have a final reporting poll. I'll go ahead and end the recording and move us over to that poll now.